welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Samantha and these are my shelves. And today I'm taking off the reader hat and I'm putting on the writer hat. And I really want you to imagine that I like committed to the bit and I actually had like different hats that I put on and off. But if I put on a hat, you're all gonna immediately unsubscribe because it, it does something to my face and it's, it's not nice. I've never looked good in a hat, but that's neither here nor there. I really enjoyed a video I made two weeks ago, three weeks ago about my journey to becoming an agented author and um, sort of my experience going through the query process. And I've decided that I do wanna do a little bit more writing and author content in addition to my bookish content. I was thinking about what I wanted to do for my next video about writing and being an author. And I came upon the idea that I wanted to share some of my advice and my tips and my experience with self-editing your novel. And I wanna say I'm coming at this from the perspective of someone who's aspiring to be traditionally published. I don't know how much uh, of this advice or my experience will be applicable to you if you're looking into self-publishing. I think that's a very different animal and whew, the people that do that, y'all are warriors. <laughs> you are warriors. I do not have the mental fortitude to self-publish, so uh, we'll pretend I have a third hat on. I tip my hat to you. Not a fedora though, that would be creepy. And in case you didn't see my last video or if this is your first time on my channel, hi, hello, I'm really happy that you're here. Uh, you might be wondering, okay girl, who are you to give me this advice? Well, I am a recently agented author. I am agented by Joanna Castillo of Writer's House. I'm currently getting ready to start revisions on my debut suspense novel and hopefully going on sub in March or April. I am really kind of wading into the thicket of traditional publishing. And I think one of the most important parts of getting an agent, aside from your query letter, your synopsis, your sample pages is does the manuscript hold up? If your book starts off really strong and then it falls off, or if the second act is really weak, if you haven't given everyone a fully developed character arc, if your writing just isn't there yet, there's so many reasons that an agent could request your full and then the full manuscript just doesn't live up to their expectations. And the first step that a writer can take to making sure your book does live up to a literary agent's expectations is getting it self-edited. Obviously, you need more than one person to read your book. Don't think that you can just self-edit and call it good. You need critique partners, you need beta readers, but first and foremost, you need to self-edit. Self-editing is a necessary skill for any and all writers. Traditionally published, self-published, aspiring to be published, just writing for fun. Editing is a skill in and of itself that you have to hone. Don't ever hand someone your first draft. Like if you love someone and you care about them, you will not hand them your first draft because you know it's not gonna be up to snuff. But what you are going to do is self-edit it and make it as polished and perfect and fucking amazing as you can make it as one person. Before I dive into what that process looks like for me and the steps that I took in learning how to self-edit, I wanted to spell the one myth about self-editing and first drafts that really sticks in my craw. And that is that your first draft will be an irredeemable mess, that it will just be a, a nuclear fallout war zone <laughs> of writing. That does not have to be true. Uh, speaking as someone who drafts pretty cleanly, uh, your first draft does not have to be a disaster. And that's not a dig at anyone who drafts really messily. I know that's a word, but I don't like it. Apologies if there was a weird cut there. My wonderful girlfriend just came and brought dinner. Uh, very nutritious, very authentic Mexican food. Um, it's, it's really a niche thing. It's called Chipotle. I don't know if you've heard of it. And she also brought me a squirt. I'm feeling very grateful and loved. But back to the topic at hand about first drafts. Your first draft can be clean, it can be messy, it can be somewhere in between. You'll have to self-edit no matter how clean your draft is or how messy it is. But I really resent the implication that like, oh my God, you're just gonna have to like tear down your first draft from scratch. That's not true for everyone. I think if you are a really messy drafter, that will be true. But if you're like me, I most of the bones of my story remained intact. So your mileage may vary, as I like to say. The first step on your self-editing journey should be to give yourself some much needed time and space between you and your manuscript. Once you finish it, you're like, okay, draft one, done. She's in the books put it away and don't look at it. I know that advice gets trotted out a lot, but it is so true. You need that time and that space because you are too close to it right when you finish. And I know that temptation is there because I've been there. I've been like, okay, I gave myself time and space. It was an hour, I cooked dinner. That's a lie, I don't really cook dinner. But an hour, a day, it's not enough space. Some people, I think like Stephen King said you should give yourself three to six months. I don't think that's realistic for most people. You finished a book, you're riding the high and you, you wanna get to it, you wanna start editing. I personally gave myself two weeks. In retrospect, I do wish I'd given myself a little bit longer, but 
Um, I would say at least two weeks. If you can do more like a month, I think that's fantastic. Or if you can do three or six months, then I would absolutely encourage you to do that. But I think it's unrealistic to expect everyone to immediately be able to put something away for that long. Especially if you're like me, you're like, okay, well, I have to be writing. So you're gonna wanna start a new work in progress and, and get going on a new project. And I found that I would lose enthusiasm for what I was editing. So I didn't let myself do any writing for basically two weeks, which is horrible. <laughs> but for me, I just needed to have my focus be on my editing and not on drafting anything new. Your next step should be to simply just read through your manuscript start to finish. Don't edit it, don't touch it, leave it, read it start to finish and make a note of what you can immediately identify as weak. Does your story take too long to get going? Do you take too long to introduce the protagonist? Is your, is your act two kind of flabby? Is your ending unsatisfying? Those are all things that you'll be easily able to identify because you're now approaching it as a reader or at least as much of a reader as you can because you're always gonna be the writer and you're always gonna see it a little bit differently than someone who comes to it with fresh eyes. But that's where that time and space comes in. So do that first read through and make a note immediately of anything you wanna change. I know for me, my first read through, there were a few scenes where I was like, hey, this isn't quite long enough. Like this interaction happens too fast. There's an interaction in my fourth or fifth chapter between two young girls and a police officer and the police officer let them go way too easily. And I realized on, on my first pass through like, hey, that was, that was way too easy. This scene needs to go on longer. So things like that, you'll immediately get a sense for, make a note of it, and then when you do your first editing pass, that's something you can come back to. The next thing I did was look at my characters. Does every character with an arc have an arc that wraps up in a satisfying way? Not every character will have an arc, and that's okay. Some characters are minor and they, they don't need to have growth, they're just there to, to facilitate something else. That's fine. But all of your important characters, all of the ones that do have an arc, that needs to conclude in a satisfying way. And I was really guilty of this one on my first, uh, my first pass through, the first time I read it. I had one character whose arc I completely neglected to wrap up. Uh, and it was kind of embarrassing when I went back and read it. I was like, oh my God, this dude had this big thing happen to him and I didn't even like address it at the end. I addressed the fallout on the protagonist's part, but not on the supporting character's part. And I went back through and I said, okay, this is actually pretty easy for me to wrap up and conclude in a satisfying way. He just needs one more conversation with the protagonist. And I was able to go through and add that. And I was like, there we go, bing, bang, boom. Ew, can I leave that in? That was horrible. And I am glad I caught that because I think an agent who would have read my full manuscript would have been like, hey, you completely forgot to finish this character's arc. And it was, it was a pretty glaring omission. So make a mental checklist or make a real checklist if you like to write things down. I like to put things in my notes app and ask yourself, does everyone's arc conclude in a satisfying way? The satisfying part is important because you can always wrap up a character or a story in a way that is not satisfying and that's something that you'll be able to find as well. So you've done your first major developmental edit. Now what you need to do is read your manuscript aloud. I know that you just heard that advice and you were like, babe, I wrote a 90,000, 100,000, 120,000 word novel. I am not, I am not, and I repeat, I am not reading that whole thing out loud. And I had the exact same hesitation. My 90,000 word novel is about the equivalent of 350, 360 pages in a regular book and that, felt really daunting, but there is an easy way around this. And I can speak for myself as someone who uses Microsoft Word. If Microsoft Word has a million fans, I am one of them. If Microsoft Word has one fan, that fan is me. If Microsoft Word has no fans, that means I am no longer on this earth. I die on the hill of Microsoft Word. You will never catch me using Google Docs. I Maybe I need to make a video about the superiority of Microsoft Word, but I, I understand it's not accessible. I, I pay out of pocket for it just because that's what I'm familiar with and it's what I like. But the thing that I like about Microsoft Word, and this could totally be a feature in Google Docs or Pages or whatever drafting tool you use, is that there is a read aloud feature, at least in the app on my phone. I'm sure there's one on my desktop, but I don't like to do it at my desktop. What I would do while I was at work is I would put in my AirPods and I would set the Microsoft Word app to read my story aloud. And I kind of regret doing that while I was working because my attention was a bit divided. It helped me identify stilted dialogue. It helped me identify scenes that were really clunky, descriptions that were just bad. And hearing it out loud gives you a completely different perspective than reading it. No matter how authentic or, or pure you think your voice is, it will not be the same as reading it aloud or having it read aloud to you. Um, I really think, if you can find a way, I'm sure it's very, very easy outside of Microsoft Word, 
find a way to have an app read it to you and I promise you, you will be amazed at the things that you catch. For me, there were scenes and lines of dialogue where when I wrote them, I thought, this is brilliant, this is perfect. And then I had it read aloud to me and I was like, oh my God, was I drinking? what was wrong? What was happening here? <laughs> so right now, this is where your focus starts to shift away from the bigger developmental edits and more toward the line edits and just the, the littler things, how things are working on a scene level, a paragraph level, a line level. The big picture stuff should be addressed first, and now you can move on to more of the technical craft level things. God, I like, I lobster clawed my hands there and I gave myself the ick. I didn't like that at all. And now that we're delving into more of the line edit territory, we have to talk about killing your darlings. I know it's cliche. I know everyone trots it out, but there will be lines of dialogue. There will be entire scenes. There could even be entire subplots or characters that you will have to cut and it sucks and it hurts and you will not want to do it. But it's better to do it now than to have a critique partner or a beta reader go like, hey, th this whole scene is just kind of like a mess. I didn't really connect with it. I'm not sure it serves the plot. If you can identify it on your own and you get that inkling of, mm, I'm not sure this is serving the plot or the character or, or building the world or anything. This is just like a fun bit of banter I wanted to write or maybe you wanted to write smut, whatever it is it might need to go. An asterisk for something like smut or world building, um, if you're writing fantasy, obviously you're gonna have a lot more leeway with the world building. If you're writing romance, obviously um, smut might be required. I am not a huge romance reader, but by God, I know the power of smut talk. So take that advice with a grain of salt, but if you're writing something outside of those genres where, where things like that are expected, or maybe you're writing more lit fic, something like that, um, you're gonna have to be brutal. Something that I do to sort of ease the pain of killing my darlings is I will take them and I have a word doc that is just a graveyard for lines that I loved, scenes that I loved. I was really lucky um, when I did my self edit and have my beta readers, I didn't really have anything huge that I had to cut. I didn't have subplots or characters that kind of got thrown out. Um, so I can't speak to it on that level, but I have certain scenes that I was very fond of. And when I did my self edit, I realized like, no, this actually has to go. This isn't, this isn't serving anything. And that's really painful, but having it there to go back to and look back on is very helpful for me, especially if you are taking things out on a line by line level or at the paragraph level, you might find that a work in progress later down the road. Um, it has something that that line that you had to cut from book number one can fit perfectly into book number four that you end up writing. So don't completely write something off. There's always a chance that you can, you can resuscitate it. You can bring it back to life, but just in a different form with a different coat of paint. So I really, really encourage you to keep a word doc of, of things like that, that you've had to cut, but like, hey, maybe one day it'll have legs. You don't completely have to get rid of it. The idea of killing your darlings can also segue really neatly into the idea of word count. Ideally, this is something you address maybe like before you really start getting into edits, but your word count needs to be within genre conventions. And this is something else I know someone is watching this, like my 200,000 word fantasy epic, it needs every single word. It doesn't. And I don't know how to, how to tell you that other than just to say it. Um, if you are running with a really high word count, even in genres where that's expected, like fantasy or sci-fi, um, if you're north of 120K, to be frank, if you're really good and really tight, you can maybe squeak up to like 130, 140. But when you start getting into 150 and above, you are putting yourself in auto reject zone and you don't need to. Again, this is something where if you're self-publishing, you will have a little bit more leeway. But speaking as someone who pursued traditional publishing, word count really matters. And if you're thinking that you're the exception to the rule, odds are you're not. And that's really painful because if you are going into your first round of self-edits with your 200,000 words, space opera, sci-fi, magnum opus, yeah, you're gonna have to cut 70, 80,000 words. And that's gonna be absolutely brutal. But if you are pursuing traditional publishing, you need to be really realistic and be harsh. And I'm speaking as someone who didn't really have this problem, so I acknowledge it is easier said than done. My first draft was completed around 86,000 words, and by the time I had my book ready to query, I was sitting pretty squarely at 90,000. So I was pretty much at the sweet spot for my genre, which again was adult suspense, literary suspense, I was kind of splitting hairs there, but that's a topic for another video. It's also completely possible that you can have this problem in another direction. Maybe you don't have a 200,000 word fantasy epic, but you have a 50,000 word um, literary fiction piece. 
that's probably not going to be long enough. And you'll have the opposite problem when you go through. You're gonna find places to beef up your scenes, lengthen things a little more. Maybe you need to add subplots or add characters. Um, this is something I think uh, having to add is frankly a little bit harder than having to cut because you've drafted it, right? And you think like, this is perfect, this is clean, it's lean, it's chef's kiss. But that problem can go other ways too and I think that's also worth discussing. This is the point where you're going to read through your manuscript for the third time and you are really going to get in there with a fine tooth comb for self editing. And this is the part where I would do line edits, I would do proofreading, copy editing, that kind of thing. Your manuscript does not need to be completely perfect. God knows I had typos and little things missing in the version that I sent to agents, but it should be clean. It shouldn't have glaring, persistent grammatical errors. No agent is gonna reject you because you forgot an apostrophe on a possessive, for instance. But if you are constantly misusing your versus your, yeah, that's gonna be indicative of, of a pretty big problem. So go through and make sure it is as clean as possible. And this is on a grammatical level and on a line level. This is the part where you'll really look at every single sentence and say, okay, what is this doing? Is this good? Is this necessary? Am I lingering too long here? What can I condense from two sentences into one? All that good stuff. On the topic of grammar, I know that some people will recommend using Grammarly to help you do this proofreading, copy editing portion. I'm gonna come in here with a hot take. I think that if you are at the point where you are writing a full length novel and you are trying to get it traditionally published, because again, I'm speaking to this from the perspective of someone who chose to go with traditional publishing, you should probably be beyond the point where you need Grammarly's assistance. I don't think it's bad here and there, but again, if you've written a 100,000 word novel, um, your grasp on grammar and syntax should be strong enough that you don't need Grammarly to go through and help you fix all of your errors. Once you've done this level of line editing, um, if you still have it in you, and I really think that you should, I would encourage you to listen to your manuscript in an audio format once again. By this point, it should be pretty clean. Everything should, should sound pretty good to the ear, um, but you may have things that you've added in, things that you've taken out and, and have messed with your cadence somehow. So I do recommend going back through one more time listening to it and making sure everything flows really naturally. By this point, you'll be at the fourth, maybe more. You might decide that you want to um, go through and do two rounds of developmental edits. You might find like, hey, I removed the subplot. Now I need something to replace it. Your mileage may vary, but you should be on your fourth iteration of reading your manuscript by this point, And it should be just about as polished as it will be before you send it to critique partners and beta readers. And this brings us to the important point of knowing when to stop. You can over edit, it is very possible. And you will reach a point where you're gonna have to say to yourself, I have done all I can do on my own. Because the reality is you can't make a perfect manuscript on your own. You will need beta readers, you will need critique partners, hell you might give it to your mom to read and she might have great advice even though you're like hey i didn't think you were going to be be a beta reader but no that was actually really sound you can only take your manuscript so far as the author yourself and you will rely on other people to come in and give you a fresh set of eyes so there is wisdom in knowing when you have to say to yourself hey this is as far as i can take this i've done enough because you will tinker it to death speaking as someone who almost tinkered to death. That temptation is always there, right? Because you're thinking to yourself, I can make this better, or what if I do this? What if I do that? And there are always little things that you can tweak. You will tweak until the day you die if you don't pull yourself back. So once you're done, be done. Send it to people, let them critique, take their advice on board, and wait until you get their feedback before you move any further. So that is where I'm going to leave this today at the end of your self-editing process. I may come back and make a video about beta reader feedback, critique partner feedback at another point, but this is just about self-editing. I think it's one of the most important skills that you can learn as a writer because editing is a completely different animal from writing in the same way that writing a query letter is a completely different animal from writing. It takes a different set of skills and the same way you had to develop your writing skill, you have to develop your editing skill. And the best way to do that is to sit down with yourself, put in the work, put in your paces and just do it. It's like the advice everyone always gives on Reddit, um, on all the writing subreddits, just write. Just edit. You have to start eventually and you might as well start now. I sincerely hope this was helpful in some way. Um, if you are a writer and you're looking to be published, I know that it's a really daunting journey, especially once you sort of close the page on that first draft and now you're like, where do I go from here? So I hope this could be a really good starting point and maybe just give you some insight into how I went ahead and edited my novel and eventually and now got on the road to becoming traditionally published. I have my agent and 
it's exciting and I really credit a lot of that to honing my self-editing skills because by the time I got to the point of being ready to send it to other people to read, I had it pretty clean. Now on the subject of agents and edits, I will be getting my edits back from my agent hopefully in the next week or so and I am planning to do a little edit my book with me vlog. Um, I haven't vlogged before, so we'll we'll see how that goes. We'll see if I even stick to it. I could get nervous and check it out, but that's the plan right now. And I'm hoping to take everyone through a little bit more of like an intimate view of the editing process and also maybe like introduce you all to some of my cats. So keep an eye out for that in the semi near future. If you've made it to the end of this video, please go ahead, like, subscribe, leave me a comment. If you're a writer, um, tell me about your work in progress. Tell me how far you are. Tell me what genre it is. Tell me how you feel about approaching the self-editing process. I'm really excited to hear from you all and I just I love to hear about people's works in progress. I think it's so fun. Um, everyone is so creative and just writing the books of their hearts and I think that is the most wonderful thing of all. Thank you again for being here with me and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye!